America was once a nation of people who rose with the sun and worked out their lives in the fields, planting, tending their crops, and harvesting. Most were open, honest people, their roots laced deep with loyalty to friends and neighbors. Their lives revolved around field, home, and church. With the coming of the machine, the people were pushed off the land, where the soil once furled under 100 plows, one gasoline engine now roars. The workers of the field have now become the workers of industry in America's cities. Their home places can be seen standing over the surface of rural America, skeletal reminders of days past. The people, like their needs, were simple. The callus on their hands, the food on their table, and the water in their cup were products of their own toil. The land provided basic needs, food, shelter, water. Everything else came from a town, perhaps a day's ride away. Too long and way back before the Civil War, it was a big town. Had possibly 300 blocks. Well, right out where the seat poor shop is now. Oldest building was an old store, just a general store, just like this one. Hasn't run, I'll say, in 50 years anyway. The other old store was a grist mill. People at that time, when the furnishing time was, they'd sell all the corn in the wintertime because they had to have something to eat. And when spring come, then they'd go to buying it back in meal. That's, that's fact. And I'd go up there some, maybe a couple of days during a week and grind corn possibly all day long and sack it up in 25 pound sack. Bring it back down and sell it on Saturday. This general store, providing necessities since the turn of the century, has changed little. Hal Waldrop has worked here since the time of FDR. I think I could do more business now with different types of stores. And I know I could do it easier. But if I had it heated, air-conditioned, where well, it wouldn't get so dusty and dirty, then I could put it all out on the table and let them wait on the cell and dip it in the I wouldn't have to do all the walking. Let them do the walking. I think we'd lose some of the old-timey atmosphere, I reckon you'd call it. But don't think we'd lose in any money. I don't know. If I was changed up like that, then you would just wouldn't be you to home no more. We still carry most everything that we carried 40 years ago. Try to. Such as drugs, groceries, hardware, saddles, bridles, you notion. Crosscut saws, hammers. I don't have any regular hand saws, though. Fishing supplies, horse feed, cow feed, hog feed, chicken feed, dog feed. All kind of feed, a little bit. A lot of handles, but we don't sell them anymore. That's about a thing of the past. Tractors have taken over. Dry goods and shoes. Rowan, what do you play? I guess I won't. Piece of bone out, guess. And what do you want to drink? I think mean, I'm going to drink fifth, Frank. Where you been all week? I haven't seen you much. People still want a place to hang out. In the wintertime, when the hunting season comes up, sometimes you'll have 20 or 30 and you're eating dinner. 
cut them over pizza for and give them a nickel of crackers. I cut them a can of sardines, uh, whatever they might want. Just cold cut. There's the only thing. Don't cook anything. Been hunting, you know, come in hot, tired, and I'm going to eat a slab of cheese, because you can keep, I can keep cheese better in this winter time, because it don't melt down, you know. In other words, we have a big pot-bellied stove, black pot-bellied stove, they call it, for heat in the winter, burn coal in it. Well, there's been more rabbits and squirrels and parties killed around that thing than ever has been out in the field. <laughs> you know, people get around and talk about how many there's. There's been more crop made by that stove in <laughs> that. Now, that's fact. Each year, there are fewer who talk of their crops, but that is the pattern of rural America. Few remain who farm primarily to feed themselves. Doc James has grown his sorghum in a bottom near the Tallahatchie. He has hired A.G. Newsom to come in and make his molasses. A.G. is the last molasses cook in the area and will take part of the crop as his pay. The rest is Doc's to sell at the store in Chulahoma. Doc's mules pull all day, but their human drivers must take shifts at feeding the ever-hungry mill. The crushed cane is spread to keep the mules from wearing a rut in the earth. The sweet juice draws countless bees as though it were honey. They light on men and mules alike, rest and leave without stinging. They are a part of the scheme of things. It's boiling, but I'm boiling too. But it's hot. Ain't too much white. It's just hot standing over it. Put that wood in it. You got to look up there in town and see where to put it. That was rough. The molasses maker must skim the juice for bits of pulp and cane. He keeps the fire burning evenly to not scorch the syrup. He draws off the molasses and tallies the gallons. His skill determines the value of the crop. There's only one chair at the molasses pan, and only he is allowed to sit there. I tell you what, you got to go up again. Ten gallons of juice makes one gallon of molasses. And that's how much you got to boil. And there, that barrel, I hold 60 gallons. Now, you know it can take a whole lot to boil it. <laughs>
Now the B. Pretty good. That's pretty good. Better than nothing. Put it on the back There's plenty of people wouldn't stand over this hot penny. They'd rather give you the money for it and go on about their business. <laughs> you ain't got time for food with this. <laughs> Too nasty. Get sick of it. Plenty of them could cook, but they don't know how. It ain't the age. You can be five years old and learn how to cook. He take that like you might say, plenty of old people can't drive a car. Now as a 10 and 15 year old boy, I've been driving for years. So that's the way it is with this. People done got lazy. That stuff is hard to make up. As the machines take over the skills, the craftsmen disappear. In 1910, Marion Randolph Hall opened the doors of his shop to the public. In a few years, he had six strikers apprenticed to him working the hot iron. Alone now at 83, he still lights his forge at daybreak and plies his craft till dark. Six days a week, his two days off a year, Christmas and the 4th of July. He sharpens plows, makes knives, repairs hoes and wagons. Of course, not so much as in 1910, but enough to keep him busy. To eyes accustomed to the surface perfection of factory-made items, hand-wrought tools and utensils may have a crude, rough-hewn look but the designs reflect the Smith's concern with function rather than appearance. The techniques of working iron by hand are rather simple. To sharpen a plow or a bush hog blade, you must heat it straw yellow, draw out the battered edge to the right shape and thickness, temper it and grind it sharp as a knife blade. It's deceptively easy to describe but the skills take years to develop. You're taking 50 years ago, and uh, then mostly then was horseshoeing and plow sharpening. Then if you had to, to make something, you could make anything, chisels and punches and try square. You can make that just as good as they can. It just takes longer. You make uh, anything, axes and hoes and knives and forks and plows. And, well, in fact, anything that's made out of a piece of iron, a blacksmith can do it. Well, I never did want to do a thing but blacksmith. That's all I wanted to do. I taught myself, you might say. We had a preacher live on the place, and he was the blacksmith. Well, he couldn't drop my plow, and I was little then. I was you hold your plow handles up here, you're supposed to look over. That round, the cross round goes across that hole. But I was so little, I had to look under it, and I'd have to hold to the cross round look under it at my plow. The preacher, he'd sharpen plows for everybody there. Of course, he sharpened mine. And me and my brother, brother was a little older than I was. And we was just both little boys, you know, but still, we went on down in the field. We went to plowing one morning. Well, my plow would go in the ground and out. Couldn't hold it in the ground. I couldn't, uh, just couldn't hold it. I said, I'm going and sharp, take my plow and go back up to the shop and sharpen it myself. And my brother says, you better not. You better get the preacher to sharpen that plow. I said, he done sharpened it and I can't plow with it. I said, I'm going to sharpen it myself. And I went back up there and sharpened that plow, and I went back, and it just sat there and run as smooth. And my brother just went on about it. He says, let me plow with your plow, and you take mine and sharpen it. And from that day on, I'll sharpen plows. To the medieval man, the smith was endowed with mystical qualities. He took the four basic elements, air, earth, fire, and water, and created what was needed. 
No town or village was complete without its glowing forge. It was a gathering place for farmers, loafers, and children. To protect these innocents from the dangers of leaping sparks and molten metal, the smith learned to give subtle but effective warnings. A fellow wanted a job, and he asked him what he could do. He said, most anything in the blacksmith's job. The old blacksmith they told him, he says, why? He says, I've got a, a 10-year-old boy has got more, knows more about a blacksmith shop than you do. Oh, no, no. He uh, was cutting some iron. He cut off a piece of iron. He said, would you hand me that piece of iron? And the man reached down there and picked it up. And when he did, it just burned his hand. He threw it down. He said, Lord, that's hot. And he said, uh-huh. And... So the little boy was come, come around. He said, son, hand me that piece of iron there. He said, OK, daddy. Oh, no, daddy. I can't hand you that. That's hot. <laughs> if you want to be a blacksmith, well, you got to leave everything else off but that and have that on your mind. It's all pretty hard. But if you like it, it's still all right. The farmer, with his sweat, endurance, and a team of mules, was the basis of the agrarian way of life. Other Turner may be among the last to walk behind a plow and carry to market not only a product, but a part of himself. I liked farming. I did it all of my days. I was taught that. I was raised up that way. My father, grandfather farmed. My mother farmed. That was my calling farming, and I liked it. Plying a mule, go out and hitch up my mule and ply him out there just like walking down the street. more easy to me in a way. And I get just as much out of that demand that I said, Father, the perfect job. I got cows, horses, hogs. I raise my living. I ply that mule, make that crop, raise corn, raise cotton, watermelon, sweet potato, tomatoes, peas, popcorn. I raise all that stuff. And hardly for my family. For my own benefit. But I'm going to be out there plowing a meal all day, walking down, looking down on the ground. Woo, come on back, woo. Folks don't know I'm down in the field. Look like I'm in, I'm in prison then. By myself, nobody talking, ain't singing, ain't saying nothing, just flying. I seem to be in prison. Oh, man. But singing them blues, that's my company. Farming is my motto, I like it. In the blues, that's my call. I get out there in the field, man, I plow me to death as long as I can sing. But you tell me, who do you say sing out there? I say, well, you don't want me. My baby, I know she love me, my baby. Oh, yes, I know she love me, my baby. Oh, yes, I know she loves me. She don't do nothing but kiss and hug me, my baby. Julie, oh. baby, my baby. Whoa. 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 My baby, I know she love me, my baby. Oh, yes, I know she love me, my baby. Oh, yes, I know she love me. She don't do nothing but she can hurt me, my baby. Really, baby.
Oh, yes, I know she loves me, my babe. Oh, yes, I know she loves me, my babe. Oh, yes, I know she loves me. She don't do nothing but kiss and hug me. Two blind came in, feed my mules, feed my hog, milk my cows, get my tub, take me a bath, and I sit down and wait and look for the time to get back. That's every eight days or nine days I go back to my farm plowing with the color of eight my ground. When August gets you in, I sit back and knock my head back and sit in the shade and look for it like, and that's my rest there. I done worked hard for you and don't cost me anything. The sun slowly finishes the job started by man. Then the waiting begins. Waiting for the harvest and preparing for the winter months. Rural Americans are a hardy breed. They are forced to endure hard work and hard times. The key to their survival is their neighbor. In early fall, the food is cooked and the people come together in a celebration of the cool weather and the coming harvest. The ties neighbor to neighbor, are strengthened once a year as the people are drawn by the sound of the music. They come down the long, dusty road to renew the friendships that give meaning to their vanishing culture. 